today we're going to finish our short series in the book of Revelation. We've gone through chapter 4. We, last week we're, we were in the beginning of chapter 5. And we saw first the throne of God and God the Father with His right hand holding the scroll. And the scroll was written on both sides, meaning that it was complete and full. And it showed that it, God had a full plan for His creation. And that it was holy, perfect, and pure. And that it also included judgment against everything that is evil, that is wicked, that is against God and His will. And the angel begins with that question, who is worthy? And that's the question. It just echoed, who is worthy? The question wasn't who is willing or who had the strength to open that scroll. But the challenge is this. Who has a rank so exalted? Who has attributes so marvelous? Who has led a perfect life that is holy and pure, that can approach the throne of God and take the scroll from the right hand of God and open that perfect scroll? Who is worthy? And there was silence. For there is no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth that was found worthy. And the gospel, the John, the apostle John, cried. He cried in anguish because he knew that the scroll must be open. That if the scroll was not open, God's plan of perfection would not come to pass. And the judgments and the evil would still reign. He cried out in anguish, but then an elder came to him and said, Weep no more. For the line of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered. And so we find that Jesus is not just the lamb, he is the lion, the one full of majesty, power, and might, and authority. But when John turned to find and look for the lion, he didn't find the lion, did he? He found the lamb. And not just an ordinary lamb, but the lamb who was slain. And so today, let's gather again in heaven, around the throne, around the Lamb who was slain, and worship. And today we find that there are two primary aspects of worship. One is bowing, and the other is singing. So let's take a look at bowing. Verse 8 from chapter 5. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So in a moment, we're going to get to the bowing, the falling down of, on the knees. But just to mention briefly, it was the elders who held a harp and a bowl of incense. Now, the harp was not like your... Uh, orchestra harp you know the big harp where you've got to sit and they play all of these different strings it wasn't one like they see in the movies with the angels in heaven on the clouds playing the harps no this would have been a 10 string harp the one that we actually have from from psalm 96 that was read it was that that type of heart and actually sorry psalm 33 from our call to worship this morning so it was that type of harp that they played, so there's music already in heaven. And then they had bowls of incense. Now, bowls of incense were actually from very early on. You find that God had commanded to have bowls of incense when they built the tabernacle. And they would burn the incense and it would waft up. And that helps us understand the, ra the raising, the rising of the prayers. This is what uh, David wrote in Psalm 141. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you. 
the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. So these are the prayers. So in heaven around the lamb who was slain, there are already, already the prayers of the saints being lifted up. But now let's get down to the bowing. Because what did they do? When the lamb who took the scroll from the right hand of God, they fell down at his feet. I really thought about this quite a bit, and there's really not much that we have in our experience of falling down at somebody's feet, of giving honor and praise that way. Yes, you might see kings or queens, and when the king or queen, say the, the queen comes in, there's quiet. People might bow, curtsy before her. But it's different, isn't it? It's out of respect for the position, not necessarily who she is. And yes, I, I thought about uh, perhaps people who have gone through war and they receive the hero's welcome. And, and often though, with the hero's welcome, there, there's not that moment of silence or reverence. There's cheering, there's jubilation, there's a, maybe a ticker tape parade. And then I thought, well, maybe there is uh, you know, people receive the Medal of Honor, which is the highest medal you can get. And, and what it says, the Medal of Honor is for conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity in combat with an enemy. And people who receive the Medal of Honor, they are the ones who are saluted. Even those who are higher rank will salute them. But I thought, that's, that's not even it. I mean, where do we have an experience of bowing down in reverence? Quite a few years ago, probably 15 or so years ago, I took some martial arts training in Shot Shotokan Karate. And uh, in that particular uh, training, they would have a picture of the master's master's master. And they had that. And beforehand, you were supposed to bow down in respect to this master. And I found I couldn't do that. I just, I, I just couldn't do it. Because in bowing down like that before that person, that's giving some honor and praise greater than I would give a person. But where in your life have you just fallen on your knees before the Lord? Because of who he is. This is the lamb who was slain. Now the elders, they had position, they had power, they, they had authority, they were sitting around, they were on thrones themselves with crowns on their head. And the, the creatures, certainly the angelic creatures, they had certain power and might as well. But before the lamb who was slain, they fell down at his knees in worship. And they sang. And that's the second part of worship here. Verse 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. See, the question that the angel asked, who is worthy, they answer it right there in their song. They say, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain. Now, many people intellectually know that, the, that Jesus was slain, but they don't understand the worth. They really don't understand the depth of that. Let me give you a little story. There was a fellow who uh, had for years, for generations, his family had owned this house, and in the attic he found an old dusty Bible that he ended up just throw, throwing away. And he told his friend about it. He said, yeah, it was just this Bible and it was written by this gluten somebody. And his friend said, gluten? You mean like wheat? And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe it was gluten. And the friend said, gluten? You mean like Gutenberg? 
The Gutenberg Bible? You threw away a Gutenberg Bible? That's one of the first books that was ever printed. A Gutenberg Bible just last year sold for over $2 million, and you threw that away. And the guy said, yeah, I couldn't have gotten any money for it anyway. You know, some guy named Luther scribbled all over it in German. <laughs> yeah. Some people don't even know what the cost is, and they, if they do even know the cost, they don't know the worth of something or someone. Worthy is the one who was slain. You see, his death, the death of Jesus, is the dividing line in history. On one side is sin and damnation. On the other side is reconciliation and salvation. On one side is death, and on one side is life. And that's the dividing line. And people don't understand that particular dividing line. You see, without his death, there would be nothing else in this life but pain and sorrow and tear and toil and nothing else. Without God, without Jesus, that's all we have to look for. We eat, we drink, we do stuff knowing that it is futile, that is nothing. And this is what atheists have to contend with. That this life without Christ, without God, without the death and resurrection is just meaningless. It is nothing. Shakespeare even wrote about this. King Macbeth. King Macbeth, who through many machinations and killing and murder and rose to power. At the very end, he says this. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all of our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Without Jesus, without his death and resurrection, that's all there is. But because he came, because he died for us, we have this, as Peter wrote, but know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with, per with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. That's the dividing line. That's the dividing line in history. But why Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die? Simply, couldn't an ordinary man die? Couldn't an ordinary man have done this? And the answer is no. Because between the gulf of what we have done against a holy God creates that gap so wide and deep that nothing, nothing, no single man, created being, could bridge that gap. A perfect payment had to be made to pay for all of that sin. That perfect payment was Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. But you know what? Even that, even that sounds too easy. It just sounds like this sentence that we say. And we don't understand then the cost, and we don't understand the worth of the Lamb who was slain. 
Do you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac? Pastor Erickson preached on that this past Wednesday. God tested Abraham, didn't he? He said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Now think about that, parents. We want to raise, we want to nurture, we want our children to grow. Would you sacrifice your son? The trepidation, the fear that you might have regarding that? Could you go through that? This is what Abraham said to Isaac, because they were both kind of worried about it. And it's a prophetic statement. Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb with a burnt offering, my son. Now, it does not say that God would provide for Abraham or God would provide for Isaac. It says God would provide for himself. You see, it was God the Father who provided his son, his only son, the son whom he loved, the son with whom he was well pleased, the son he said to everyone, listen to him. This is the son whom he loved sacrificed, that he gave up for the world. But he just didn't give him up, did he? He actually forsook him. He forsook him and he abandoned him at the greatest time of need. Think about it. Jesus was flogged. And again, that's pretty clinical in our mind. But when it says he was flogged, it's almost assured that on the ends of the whip for the flogging, they had tied little sharp pieces of bone or metal. And when they flogged him, those little pieces of metal or bone would hit the flesh and tear open the flesh. Just not a little cut, but literally tearing open the flesh. It was so horrific that people who flogged others, and they got skilled in this, they could literally rip open the flesh so that the intestines would be seen. This was Jesus who was flogged and he was bleeding. This was Jesus who had to carry the cross beam. And he couldn't carry it. So Simon of Cyrene was put and pressed into service. This was his beloved son that the father sent to the cross and the nails in his wrists and his feet. And then he couldn't breathe. And in that moment of anguish, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there was silence. The father didn't answer. His son cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the father was silent. In that moment, there was complete separation. There was an anguish greater than anything in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. There was anguish. But God provided for himself the lamb, his son who was slain. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Paul wrote in Romans, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Because of the cost, because of what he had din, did, because of the shedding of his blood, there's reconciliation, and because of that, there is rejoicing. Because of that, when you understand the worth of who Jesus is 
and what He has done, a song wells up in you. You might know the song, How Can I Keep From Singing? It's one of my favorites. I'm going to read some of it to you. It says, My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the sweet though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What though the joys and, my, and comforts die, the Lord my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs the night he giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that refuge clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? And this is the praise that we do. We sing. And not only did the elders, not only did the creatures, but the angels sang in this chorus. Verse 11 and 12, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. When it says myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, it's not to try to get a precise number on there. It's not about being calculated to 100 million or 160 or 200 million, whatever that is. It simply means there were innumerable angels singing in this chorus. And did you notice in this chorus they list seven attributes, characteristics of Christ. Do you remember seven being the perfect number? And so they say power, Wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. What else more can be said? <sighs> Too often our praise is rather shallow. Include myself in that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I kind of we sometimes just stop with that. Perhaps this week, it might be good to pray as David prayed. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of, Father, of, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all, both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. See, the praise that's given to the Father is actually echoed and not just echoed but it is strengthened that all of creation now gives praise in singing this song to Jesus it says this and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Now, if you have attuned yourself to Scripture, you know that what is being spoken in here, what is actually spoken earlier in one of Paul's letters. In one of Paul's letters to the Philippians, he gave a prophetic statement. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus 
Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, here's the thing. Doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus now or not. Whether you reject him now or not. There are many people who say it doesn't matter. And they're on this side right here. They say, that's fine. But what they don't know is at the end, everyone will bow to Jesus. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you are. Everyone will bow to Him. Everyone will give Him praise and honor and glory. That's the Lamb who was slain. Who has taken away the sin of the world. People spat on Him. They called Him a fool. They rejected Him. But He is the one full of power and might and glory. And we give Him honor and praise and blessing forever and ever. And does your heart say amen to that? See, if your heart doesn't say amen to that, you need to get down on your knees. You need to understand the cost of what He did and the worth of who He is until your heart cannot but sing, Amen, Amen, Amen.